Howdy, my name is Nonat, and welcome to the deep dive for the Monk class in Pathfinder 2e. And say hello to chat, too! <laughs> Hi guys! <laughs> this won't impact the video, but I'm actually doing this recording live in front of 136 live stream viewers. They're here hanging out, talking to me between takes. If this goes really well on the stream, which apparently it is, and you in the comments would like to see this happen again, do leave a comment down below telling me that you'd love to see me record these videos live, because it's already been a lot of fun and we've barely started. And while you're down there, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more Pathfinder 2e content. And also while you're down there, there should be a pinned comment below talking about the No Nat Ones Monster Month TM. If you're not aware, all throughout the month of August, I have been uploading brand new kobold monsters for Pathfinder 2e, starting from CR1 and building up all the way to CR20. We are already at CR10 by the uploading of this video. So there are 10 brand new monsters available to all known at one's patrons of as little as $5 a month and up. So if that interests you and you're looking for some new kobold monsters to use in your campaign, click the link in the description or the pinned comment below this video to go over to the Known At One's Patreon page and check it out. Also, one more thing before we talk about Punchy Boys. This video is sponsored by Moonlight Maps. If you are looking for high res, high quality gridded or ungridded battle maps for your game, check out Moonlight Maps in the description and the pinned comment below. They have an amazing selection. You can pledge to them on Patreon to get monk, uh, maps delivered to you every week, or you can buy them straight out of their store. Thank you to Moonlight Maps for sponsoring this video, and I'm stuttering, and this sponsored segment is over! <laughs> Anyway, that's enough selling out. Let's talk about monks. Like most martial classes, they get strength or dexterity as their key ability score and 10 hit points plus constitution per level. Monks only start trained in perception, but they are the only class that begins the game expert in all three saving throws. Fortitude, reflex, and will saves. Monks, and this is gonna be a continuing theme throughout the levels, monks have the highest saving throws of any class in the game. They gain four plus their intelligence modifier in skills and are of course trained in simple weapons and trained in unarmed strikes. Not expert. Monks are actually untrained in all armor, meaning they are pretty much always worse wearing armor than if they are unarmored. But to make up for that, they are expert in unarmored defense, meaning they get a flat plus four as long as they're not wearing any armor. Obviously, that's what you're going to do with the monk. There's not a whole lot else to do with it. Monks are actually similar to fighters in that they do not get a subclass. All monks start with the exact same features except for their monk feet. And all monks get Flurry of Blows. Flurry of Blows is an incredibly powerful action that new players get wrong 90% of the time. It's very simple. For one action, you get to make two strikes. If both strikes hit the same target, their damage is combined and treated as a single blow when it comes to resistance. Now what everyone gets wrong is this next line. Apply your multiple attack penalty to the strikes normally. What this means is the second attack is going to be at minus four, assuming it's an agile unarmed strike. If it's not agile, it's going to be at minus five like a normal attack. So even though the monk can attack more times per turn with Flurry of Blows, they still suffer the multiple attack penalty like normal. Aside from their level one feat, monks also get Powerful Fist, which is pretty simple. Instead of a 1d4, their fist attacks deal 1d6 damage, and they do not take the minus two penalty for making a lethal attack with their fist. As usual, before we get to the monk feats, we're gonna go over all of the class features they get by leveling up, and of course, we're gonna skip over the obvious stuff. Skill feats, general feats, everyone gets those. What everyone doesn't get is incredible movement, which might be the single most powerful class feature on the monk. This is a permanent 10 foot status speed upgrade. Plain and simple. And it gets faster with level. At levels seven, 11, 15, and 19, the monk's base movement speed goes up by five feet. This means an elven monk at level three with the swift elf ancestry feat can already have a 45 foot movement speed. Uh, chat has very kindly informed me that it is nimble elf, not swift elf, so thank you, livestream. At third level, they also get mystic strikes, which sounds super cool, but doesn't really give you any direct benefits. Basically, your fists count as magic weapons when it comes to anything that is resistant to non-magical damage. Don't get me wrong, that's really good, and it's just nice to have as a passive, 
but if you want anything like a plus one or striking, you still need the hand wraps of Mighty Blow's magic item. Of course, they get skill increases, ability boosts, and ancestry feats, but their perception also increases to expert at level five. On top of that, their unarmed strike and simple weapon proficiencies also increase to expert. But then at level seven, path to perfection is where monks get really interesting. Most classes get a single specific saving throw that increases to master and then gets to auto critically succeed normal successes. Barbarians get fortitude, clerics get will. It's usually pretty simple. Monks get to pick theirs. Upon reaching level seven, the monk may pick fortitude, reflex, or will save and increase that saving throw to master and auto crit succeed any normal successes with that save. It is such a cool ability to have that option. And they also get weapon specialization like most other martial classes, giving a slight damage bonus based on proficiency. Ninth level's Metal Strikes is a little upgrade to Mystic Strikes, and this one can actually play in pretty well. Basically, your fists are simultaneously treated as cold iron and silver weapons, meaning if you're fighting Fey or a werewolf or something that is weak to either of those metals, your fists capitalize on that weakness, which is really cool. And I should say, it's not just your fists, it's all unarmed strikes. So if you're kicking for whatever reason, it still gets metal strikes, which is so cool. Level 11 is the second path to perfection, meaning you can pick either of the other two saving throws you didn't pick before and increase that one to master. Just, there's nothing wrong with this and this is amazing. And then at 13th level, they become master proficiency in unarmored defense. Level 13 also bumps unarmed strikes and simple weapon proficiency to master. Level 15 increases their weapon specialization damage and grants the third path to perfection. With the third path to perfection, you cannot pick the third saving throw that you have not improved. Instead, you pick one of the two you increased to master and increase that one all the way to legendary. Now, your critical failures with that save become normal failures, and if you fail against a damaging effect, you take half damage anyway. So this basically gives you one legendary, one master, and one expert saving throw. Level 17 makes all of your unarmed strikes treated as adamantine, which is fantastic because tons of monsters, specifically high level golems, have resistance to all physical damage, even magical physical damage, except for adamantine. So that'll help you circumvent that. And Graceful Legends increases your unarmored defense to legendary, your monk class DC to master, and your key spells to master as well. We'll get to key spells in a minute. And finally, at level 19, as a monk, you have purged incompetence from your techniques. The first time you attack on your turn, if you roll lower than a 10, it counts as a 10. Now this does not work if you roll higher than a 10 and then roll lower than a 10 on your next attack. This only affects the first attack every turn. But still, to have a guaranteed 10 or higher on your first strike of every turn is pretty phenomenal. All right. Class features and starting things are out of the way. Let's get into the nitty and also the gritty. Monk feats. Starting off with crane stance. Before I even get into this, let's talk about stances, cause they're kind of important. Stances are simple, but very important to monks. Typically a stance costs one action and you assume a stance of some kind. This will give you different bonuses, perhaps give you access to new attacks, and as long as you are constantly meeting the prerequisites, you stay in that stance and continually gain its benefits unless you willingly leave it, fall unconscious, or break the prerequisites for that stance. So aside from a few, most of the level one monk feats are stances. So let's go over those now. Crane stance, the only requirement is that you are unarmored, and most, if not all, monk stances require you to be unarmored. With crane stance, you get a plus one circumstance bonus to armor class as long as you're in the stance, and you can only make crane wing unarmed attacks. This is important to note, as different stances have different wording. Crane stance mentions you can only make crane wing attacks. But if we scroll down and look at dragon stance, you can see that you can make dragon tail attacks. So keep this in mind when looking at stances. Depending on the stance you're in, you may be limited to only a specific type of attack. 
Crane Wing are pretty much the same as Fist Attacks, 1d6 bludgeoning, agile, finesse, non-lethal, and unarmed. Also while in Crane Stance, your ability to jump is increased. The DC for long jump and high jump both reduce by 5, and you can jump 5 feet farther forward or 2 feet higher than normal people attempting these maneuvers. Very cool. Dragon Stance is if you want to be the hard-hitting monk. Like all stances, it's a single action to assume it, and you gain access to Dragon Tail Attacks, where you kick with the force of a dragon's tail. These are 1d10 bludgeoning unarmed strikes and the strongest unarmed strikes available to a level 1 monk. Keep in mind that these have the backswing, non-lethal, and unarmed traits. These are not finesse or agile, so you cannot use your dexterity to hit with them, and it is a full minus 5 multiple attack penalty, meaning that dragon stance is a little bit worse with flurry of blows. Additionally, while in Dragon Stance, you can ignore one square of difficult terrain while striding. Pretty cool, and remember that is per stride action. So if you stride twice, you can ignore one square, finish that stride, and then if you stride again, ignore one square and finish that stride. So keep that in mind, that is something that not a lot of people pick up on. Next up, Key Rush, which grants you a focus point and the Key Rush focus spell. This is important to note, monks do not start with a single focus point like most other focus casters. Monks do not get a focus point until they take a focus spell feat like Key Rush. Key Rush is super simple, super easy, and super useful. For a single action and focus point, you can stride twice, or step twice, or stride and then step or step and then stride. Basically, you can take two actions, either can be a stride or a step. On top of that, at the end of those two actions, you become concealed until the start of your next turn. Really nice, makes you harder to hit, really good action economy, no complaints. After that, we have Key Strike, another focus spell for monks. Key Strike is fantastic at level 1. Of course, it costs a focus point, so you're only using it once per encounter, but it gives both attacks on your flurry of blows a plus 1 to hit, and 1d6 extra damage to both. This is fantastic for stances that have agile or finesse attacks, so they're a little more accurate. Uh, at level 1, being able to attack at plus 1 and then only a total of minus 3, that's amazing. Plus 1d6 to both hits. Again, at level 1, nuts. On top of that, these can be force damage, lawful damage, negative damage, or positive damage with your key. So if you know something's weak to positive damage, you can change it to that. Or, if you're not sure, just use force, because force almost always works. Monastic Weaponry is a way for a monk to expand its available weapons. When you take this feat, you gain access to all of the uncommon weapons with the monk trait, and any time your proficiency rank for unarmed strikes or simple weapons increases, your proficiency with monk weapons also increases, even if they happen to be martial. Additionally, so long as you have this feat, any weapon with the monk trait can be used in place of any unarmed strike unless it specifically says so, such as Crane Stance saying you have to make crane wing attacks, you cannot use a monk weapon. However, with Flurry of Blows, you can make those attacks with a weapon instead of your fists. Mountain Stance is one of my personal favorite monk stances at level 1. When you enter this stance, you can only make 1d8 bludgeoning falling stone unarmed attacks. But, while in this stance, you get a plus 4 item bonus to your armor class. Now, this comes with a big penalty. You cannot add any of your dexterity to your armor class as it gives you a dex cap of plus 0. So who is this for? Well, this is for your 18 strength 10 dex monk, and it makes that completely viable. Not all monks need to be doing triple backflips. On top of the armor class, you also get a plus 2 bonus against being shoved or tripped because you are firm like a mountain. It's subtle. But also your movement speed is reduced by 5 feet. At levels 1 and 2, this can be tough, but once you're level 3 and you get incredible movement, this isn't really a big deal anymore, as you'll still have 5 foot more movement speed than the average character. Also, keep in mind, even though this does give you an item bonus, it does stack with things like armor potency runes, so even though you're in this mountain stance, don't think that doesn't mean you can't. 
enchant your armor. Don't think that doesn't mean you can't. That is a triple negative and I am- Tiger Stance is a fun one. When you enter Tiger Stance, you can make 1d8 Tiger Claw slashing unarmed strikes, which is a really cool damage type for an unarmed strike. These have the standard agile finesse unarmed non-lethal traits, but on a critical hit, they inflict 1d4 persistent bleed damage. To have a melee attack, especially at level one, that can inflict persistent damage is super cool. Also, as long as your speed is 20 or higher, which it is, you're a monk, you can step up to 10 feet with your step action, which is insane. Wolf Stance is pretty similar to Tiger Stance. You get 1d8 piercing wolf jaw unarmed strikes, and these have the finesse, agile, unarmed, non-lethal, and backstabber traits. The backstabber trait allows these unarmed strikes to deal plus one precision damage to flat-footed targets, and if you have a plus three potency rune, you deal two bonus precision damage. Doesn't scale that well, but hey, plus one damage to pretty much all your attacks. Not bad. Also worth mentioning, while flanking in Wolf Stance, your unarmed strikes gain the trip trait, and this is important because weapons with the trip trait actually add their item bonus to the trip attempt. So while in Wolf Stance, if you are flanking someone and make a trip attempt with a plus one hand wraps of mighty blows, you get to add that plus one to your trip trait. I was so close! I'm leaving that in! The APG adds some cool stance options for monks as well, starting with Gorilla Stance. While in Gorilla Stance, you can only make 1d8 bludgeoning Gorilla Slam unarmed strikes. These have the Backswing, Forceful, Grapple, Non-Lethal, and Unarmed traits. Backswing, if you happen to miss an attack against a target, you actually get a plus one to hit on the follow-up attack. Sort of reduces your multiple attack penalty slightly if you miss. Forceful gives you a circumstance bonus to damage to your second, third, and so on attacks each turn. Your second attack gets a bonus to damage equal to the number of weapon damage dice, and your third attack gets double the weapon damage dice, and so on. Finally, while in Gorilla Stance, you get a plus two circumstance bonus to athletics checks specifically to climb, and all successes are automatically crit successes. Very good, because monkeys climb things. Now, one that I was personally very excited for, we have Monastic Archer Stance. This stance only does two things. First off, when you take it, you become trained in the longbow and the shortbow. And of course, your proficiency with these goes up with your simple and unarmed strike proficiency. While in this stance, it only does one thing. You may use your bow in place of unarmed strikes such as Flurry of Blows. Now keep in mind, this only works when within half of your first range increment. As it says in the text, this means it needs to be within 50 feet for a longbow or within 30 feet for a shortbow. So a monk archer is not typically a backline fighter, but rather a really cool mid-ranged combatant, which I'm kind of into. Finally, stumbling stance is for an interesting, almost charisma-based monk. Entering into the stumbling stance, you sort of fake inebriation and start bobbing and weaving in really unpredictable and random patterns. While in this stance, you gain a plus one bonus to deception checks when feinting a target, and the only strikes you can make are the stumbling swing on arm strike, which deals 1d8 bludgeoning damage and has the agile, backstabber, finesse, long, 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 long lethal. Non-lethal and unarmed traits. Now the big benefit is that if you are hit by a melee strike while in stumbling stance, that enemy that struck you is flat-footed to you until your next strike or the end of your next turn. It's a really cool feature that you just sort of like going one-on-one -on -one with people and when they hit you, you get better at hitting them back. It's a really fun playstyle. Level 2's Brawling Focus is a feat that I have never seen anybody even think about taking, unfortunately. You gain crit specialization for weapons in the brawling group. Granted, that's probably all of your attacks, and the brawling crit specialization is pretty good, but it doesn't do that much. Specifically, if you get a critical hit with a weapon in the brawling group, the opponent makes a fortitude save against your class DC, and if they fail, they are slowed one for one round. Additionally, if you have monastic weaponry, you gain the critical specialization for any of those weapons, which may or may not be in the brawling group. Crush and Grab is a fun one and a great pair to Gorilla Stance. If you have successfully grappled a creature, you get to deal bludgeoning damage equal to your strength modifier. This is no check, 
This doesn't even cost an action. This just adds a small amount of guaranteed damage onto successful grabs, and it's optional. On top of that, you can make it lethal or non-lethal, which means if you know something is at like two hit points, you can grab it, constrict it, and just knock it out in a quick chokehold. Really cool. Dancing Leaf pairs very well with Crane Stance or even without it. This just increases your long jump, high jump, and leap distance by five feet no matter what. It also allows you to wall slide. Yes, if you are falling while adjacent to a wall, like down a sheer cliff face, you don't take fall damage so long as you are still next to the wall. You can just grip the wall and slide down with it slow enough that you don't take fall damage. It's really neat and I love it. Elemental Fist augments your key strike by allowing it to deal different types of elemental damage. This grants you four new options, including electricity damage with the air trait, fire damage, bludgeoning damage with the earth trait, or cold damage with the water trait. Some really, really cool things, and it specifically flavors each one. You know, if you use it for fire, it's a flickering flame. If you do cold damage, it's a crashing wave of cold water. It's a really cool feat. It doesn't make you do any more damage, but it allows you to take advantage of different weaknesses. You know, if you're fighting a fire elemental, hit it with cold damage. That's really cool flexibility. And Stunning Fist, or better than Brawling Focus. Stunning Fist is not an action. Stunning Fist is not something you have to set up. Stunning Fist is a permanent upgrade to your Flurry of Blows. So long as you use Flurry of Blows only on a single target, and either attack hits and deals damage, they need to make a Fortitude save against your class DC and become stunned one on a failure. Now what's important about this is that this is an incapacitation effect, while the slowed from the brawling crit is not incapacitation. So if they are a higher level than you, chances are they're not going to get stunned. But still, if you're fighting swarms of enemies, just being able to shut one down by one action, or three actions if they crit fail, is amazing, and Stunning Fist is just an incredible feat. Ancestral Weaponry is really cool for flavor. Basically, as long as you've taken monastic weaponry, your ancestral weapons, such as elven weapons or orc weapons or goblin weapons, now gain the monk trait, meaning you can be a goblin with a dog slicer and flurry of blows with your dog slicer. I am so here for this feat. And just for you Naruto fans, of course there's Shooting Star Stance, which is a stance that lets you use throwing weapons with your unarmed strike ability. So if you want a flurry of blows with ninja stars, now you can. Specifically with shuriken, not throwing weapons. At level four, we have deflect arrow. This is a powerful reaction that as long as you know a ranged physical attack is coming, you can use your reaction to gain four armor class against it. And if that makes it a miss, you just push it out of the way and deflect it entirely. Now you specifically do need a hand free and you cannot be flat footed against the attack. But so long as all those conditions are met, you can just push it aside. Though I love that there is specific text saying you cannot use this feat to deflect unusually massive ranged projectiles such as ballista bolts. <laughs> Flurry of maneuvers, pretty good. You can replace one or both of your Flurry of Blows strikes with shoves, grapples, or trips. Most of the time, you're not going to want to replace both because the second one is still going to be at that minus five penalty, but this does mean you can trip and then strike with your agile fist on the second attack, and if they're tripped, they're flat-footed, that's minus two, it's already agile, which means it's not even a minus, blah, blah, blah. it's a good choice. Trip into punch for one action is really good at level four. Flying Kick is basically an upgrade to Long Jump or High Jump. These are normally two action activities. This just allows you to tack a strike on to either of them. So now you can jump up eight feet, kick someone, and fall eight feet for when you really need to kick that troll right in the nose. Keep in mind that five foot reach, even though it usually doesn't come up, works up and down. So if something is 15 feet above you and you can jump 10 feet, you can reach that extra five foot space above you. So keep that in mind. Guarded movement is a simple feat. I don't personally find myself looking too longingly at it, but so long as you're moving, you get a plus four to armor class against reactions. This is useful if someone has attack of opportunity and you just need to get out of there, you get a plus four to AC, which is huge. You know, plus four is massive. So it's not a bad feat, it's just situational. And especially at low levels like level four, you're not gonna be seeing attack of opportunity all that often. Stand still. 
it's attack of opportunity. It's actually simultaneously a better and worse attack of opportunity. If a creature within reach of your melee strike takes a move action, you get to attack it. And if you critically hit, it negates that move action, disrupting it and stopping it in its tracks. The reason this is a worse attack of opportunity is that it only procs on move actions, not interact actions or anything like that, meaning you can't attack of opportunity a spellcaster with a somatic component. But what makes it really good is that a critical hit disrupts the move action. Normally, attacks of opportunity only disrupt interact actions, so that is a really cool feature. Finally, at level 4 in the core rulebook, we have Wholeness of Body, which is another key focus spell. Wholeness of Body is pretty solid. For a single action, you do one of two options. You heal yourself for 8 hit points, or attempt to counteract a poison or disease currently afflicting you. Every two levels, you heal 8 additional hit points. That's really good and scales pretty well. So by character level 9, this can heal you for 24 for a single focus point. Keep in mind that focus points come back every 10 minutes, so you can just keep charging back up and be back at fighting force in just a couple of 10 minute intervals. I'm getting a drink! I'm sweating up a storm! Oh my god! Oh god! And then Namit forgot to put his microphone back on and recorded the rest of the stream with garbage quality. So now I get to re-record everything from this point forward. But as long as I've got you captive here, I'd really quick like to advertise that this Friday the 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we are doing a very special live stream. We're going to be doing a whole lot of stuff. We're going to play some video games, we're going to talk shop, maybe talk about Pathfinder, Gen Con plans, all that jazz. But the entire stream, there will be group audience donation goals to reach. Specifically involving the Hot Sauce Challenge Book of Pleasure and Pain. This is a list of 12 hot sauces that, as you can see from the Very Scientific Pain Index, get worse and worse the farther down you get. Every time the chat hits a donation threshold collectively, I will be trying the next hottest hot sauce, potentially working all the way down to the hottest of sauces. On top of that, there are two bonus donation goals for $501,000. Should we hit $500, you, the audience, will get to decide on what video I make next. There will be a whole community post. The most liked comment will be the next video posted to the No Net Ones channel. Within reason, you sickos. And then if we make $1,000 over the course of the stream, I will write and release an entire Pathfinder 2E one-shot onto DriveThruRPG completely for free for everyone to download for the rest of time or until the internet explodes, whichever comes first. So that's Friday the 20th at 2 p.m. for about six hours or so. Feel free to come and go as you please. Hopefully that time will work for most time zones to at least slide in there for a little bit and say hi. So thank you so much for the sellout. Let's keep going with monk feats. Peafowl's stance almost feels swashbucklery for the monk. Effectively, so long as you are in this stance, you can only make strikes with a one-handed sword with the monk trait. The benefit is that once per round after you hit with this sword, you can take a step action for free. Now, this isn't huge, but it does allow you to sort of position yourself better and better. You know, sidestep around an enemy, get away from flanking, and since it's a step action, no attacks of opportunity. It's pretty good, and again, it's just action economy. It's a free step every turn, so long as you actually hit. Abundant Step at level 6 is another key focus spell. For a single action, you target one position 15 feet or farther away from you. You teleport there. You cannot teleport farther than your speed, but because you're a monk, this is probably 45 plus feet away, so you can teleport across a chasm or teleport up on top of a cliff, and it's really freaking cool. And here at level 6, we see a type of feat that I sort of deem as stance upgrades. They might offer a new action or just a flat upgrade to what benefits you gain while in a specific stance, starting with Crane Flutter. Crane Flutter is a really nice defensive, offensive option. As a reaction, if you are struck by a melee attacker that you can see coming, you can spend your reaction and gain a plus three to armor class against that attack. On top of that, if this causes the attack to miss, you can then make an attack of opportunity back at them, granted at a minus two penalty. What's nice is this works even if they're out of your reach. If you have a 5 foot reach and they're attacking you with a 10 foot melee weapon with reach, you can still attack them back with Crane Flutter, which is really, really neat. 
Dragon Roar is an AoE Demoralize. All creatures within a 15-foot emanation of you must make a basic will save against your Intimidation DC or become Frightened 1, Frightened 2 on a crit failure. What's incredible about this is that if any creature begins its turn adjacent to you, the Monk, they cannot reduce their Frightened condition below 1 until the end of their next turn, which means if you keep following them after Dragon Roaring, they will basically be permanently frightened so long as they keep starting their turn next to you. On top of the top of that, your first strike against a frightened creature after the roar gets a plus four circumstance bonus to damage. It's unfortunate this isn't just a permanent upgrade to damage, but maybe that would be a little too broken. Dragon Roar can only be used once every 1d4 rounds, and regardless of the result of their saving throw, the same creature is immune to it for one minute. So you're basically getting one, maybe two of these per encounter. Key Blast, another key focus spell. Key Blast is a very versatile damaging spell. You can use from one to three actions, and the more actions you use, the greater area you affect, and the more damage you deal. For one action, you deal 2d6 force damage to all creatures in a 15-foot cone with a basic fortitude save. If they fail or crit fail, they get pushed back 5 or 10 feet, respectively. If you use two actions, the range doubles to 30 feet and deals 3d6 damage, and if you use three actions, the range doubles again to 60 feet and deals 4d6 damage. This damage also heightens incredibly well with level, that every spell level it goes up, the one action deals 1d6 more damage, and the two and three action version does 2d6 more damage. This means at higher levels, the two action version is usually going to be better because it scales just as fast as the three action. The three action will always just do 1d6 more damage and have the higher range. Important to keep in mind with Key Blast is that it does say creatures, not enemies. Your allies can take damage from Key Blast and you can't ignore them with it. Mountain Stronghold is an action you can take while in Mountain Stance that basically makes you raise a shield even though you don't have a shield. By spending one action you gain a plus two circumstance bonus to armor class until the start of your next turn. Also, when you take the Mountain Stronghold feat, you permanently gain a plus one dexterity cap while in Mountain Stance, effectively turning it into a bonus plus one to AC. Tiger Slash is effectively power attack for the monk in Tiger Stance. For two actions, you make a swipe with both of your hands. If it hits, you deal two additional weapon damage dice, or if you're level 14, three additional weapon damage dice and you get the option of pushing the target 5 feet away for free, no athletics check or nothing. If you critically hit, you also get to add your strength modifier to the persistent bleed damage caused by your tiger stance. Very solid upgrade. Water Step. Compared to the key focus spells in the stance upgrades, this one isn't great. You can now stride across flimsy liquids that would not usually hold your weight, and as long as you and your stride action on solid ground, you can run across the surface of water. If you end your stride on top of water, though, you are going to sink directly through. Whirling Throw is pretty fantastic. If you have a creature grabbed or restrained, you can make an athletics check against their fortitude DC. If you succeed at the athletics check, you get to throw them 10 plus 5 times your strength mod feet away, which if you have a 5 strength mod, that's going to be 35 feet in any direction. When they land, they take damage equal to 1d6 per 10 feet you threw them, so probably about 2 or 3d6 damage. If you critically succeed, the target also falls prone. If you fail, you just don't throw them, and if you crit fail, you don't throw them, and they escape your grab. What's really nice to mention about the Whirling Throw action is that it does not have the attack trait. So the athletics check you're making to throw them doesn't suffer from a multiple attack penalty. So if you can somehow attack them, grab them, and then rather than trying to attack again at minus 8 or minus 10, you can just Whirling Throw them for that guaranteed 2d6 bonus damage. It's pretty good. Wolf Drag is probably the single strongest monk feat here at level 6. Granted, you do need to be specifically in wolf stance. For two actions, you make a wolf jaw strike, and it gains the fatal d12 trait, meaning if you critically hit, all of your damage dice are bumped up to d12s. On top of that, if you hit at all with a normal success, 
the target falls prone. No saving throw, no athletics check, just an automatic trip effect. This is incredible. The next best feat I can compare to this is the level 10 improved knockdown for barbarians, and that's a little bit better, but to have a guaranteed knockdown at level 6 is insane. Over in the APG, a line key sucks. As a reaction, once per hour, if you cast a focus spell, you can restore hit points equal to your level plus your wisdom modifier. This basically works, in my opinion, as just an upgrade to wholeness of body. Wholeness of body healing for 8 per heightened spell level. This would, at level 6, add about 10 more healing to it. So, with a line key, you could heal maybe 20-25 hit points to yourself all at once. But aside from that, it's not that great aside from some slight survivability. On the other hand, Gorilla Pound is an incredible action for the Gorilla Stance Monk. For one action, before making a strike, you get to intimidate a target to demoralize them. And then, regardless of the result, you attack them and gain a circumstance bonus to damage equal to triple the value of their frightened condition. What's important to note about this is it doesn't matter if you frightened them or not. Combine this with your wizard friend who just cast fear and they critically failed and are frightened four, sorry, three, then your attack is still doing nine bonus damage. That's amazing. Potentially even better than that, when you take this feat, you permanently gain a 15-foot climb speed while in Gorilla Stance, which as we all know, means you do not need to roll athletics to climb anymore. That's just an incredible upgrade. One Inch Punch is also kind of like Power Attack for monks, though it's a bit more flexible and interesting than Power Attack usually is. For two actions, you get to make a strike, and if it hits, you deal an additional weapon die of damage. If you spend three actions, you get to add two additional weapon damage die. What's important to note about this, especially for the two action version, is it doesn't count as two for the multiple attack penalty, meaning you can one inch punch and then flurry of blows and still be fairly accurate. What's really interesting is that at levels 10 and 18, this scales up, and it scales up in a really interesting way. The additional weapon damage dice double and then triple, meaning for two actions at level 10, you're dealing two additional weapon damage dice, and at level 18, you're dealing three additional damage dice. But more fun than that, if you spend three actions to use one inch punch at level 18, you are dealing six additional weapon damage dice on top of your striking and whatever you have. If you want to roll a ton of dice as a monk, one inch punch is the best way to do that at high levels. Return fire is dumb and I love it. If you are in monastic archer stance and you successfully use the deflect arrow reaction, rather than just pushing it off to the side, you can catch it, load it into your bow, and fire it back at the target. Important to note, this doesn't just have to be arrows, this can be crossbow bolts, or this can even be firearm bullets that you snatch out of the sky, load into your bow, and fire back at the target. It's stupid, and I love it. Stumbling Faint is the upgrade for Stumbling Stance. This is a really solid one too. While in Stumbling Stance, if you use Flurry of Blows on a target, you can actually faint against them for free before using your Flurry of Blows. If the feint happens to succeed, the target is then flat-footed against both of your Flurry of Blows attacks rather than just the first one. This is incredible, and it's sort of a way to give your Flurry of Blows both attacks a plus two if you succeed. Very nice. Arrow Snatching is almost the exact same as Return Fire, just two levels later. If you successfully use the Deflect Arrow Reaction, you can snatch it out of the sky instead and throw it back at the original target. What's funny is that the range increment of this doesn't change. If someone shoots you from 120 feet away with a longbow, you can snatch it with your hand and then you don't take any penalties for throwing it 120 feet. It's honestly really funny. Also keep in mind, because this specifically says it is a thrown weapon, you do get to add your strength modifier to the damage. So you will very likely actually be dealing more damage with their own projectile thrown back at them. Just super awesome. Iron Blood Stance is a fan favorite. 
You can make iron sweep unarmed strikes in this stance, which have the non-lethal parry, sweep, and unarmed traits. Parry sort of allowing you to raise a shield for one action you can increase your AC by one until the start of your next turn. And the sweep trait gives you a plus one circumstance bonus to hit if you attack a different target with your second or third attack. But the big reason people take Iron Blood Stance is because while in it, you just gain resistance to, to all damage. And this scales up to 3 at level 12, 4 at level 16, and resistance 5 to all damage at level 20. Now this doesn't sound like a lot, but this adds up. Even at level 8, this means that every time you take damage, you reduce it by two. If something is hitting you multiple times, you reduce each hit by two. And the most important part, if something attacks you and that single attack deals multiple types of damage, you reduce each of those damage types by two. So if something somehow hits you for piercing, fire, and acid damage all at the same time, you're reducing the total damage by six. And that's just a level eight. Good stuff. Mixed Maneuver is Fine. For two actions, you can grapple, shove, or trip on either action, or both. Up to you. And they're both at full multiple attack penalty, and the penalty doesn't increase until afterwards. Very nice. Tangled Forest Stance is an amazing crowd control tool. While in this stance, you can make 1d8 slashing, lashing, branch unarmed strikes. These have agile, finesse, non-lethal, and unarmed. Pretty simple stuff. The main reason you want to be in this stance is for the passive effect. If an enemy within your reach tries to move away from you, they must succeed at a reflex save, acrobatics check, or athletics check against your class DC. If they fail, they are immobilized and lose that action. So if they just try to even step away from you, they have to make a reflex save, which is so cool. You can just become this monk that nobody can get away from, and they might end up wasting tons of actions just trying to distance themselves. This is amazing if you can get up to an enemy spellcaster, as spellcasters tend to have really poor reflex saves. Wall run really sucks. Don't get me wrong, this is cool. You can stride up to your speed directly up any sheer face of wall. There are some caveats, though, that make this far less useful. First off, you do need to start on horizontal ground. At the end of this stride, you get the opportunity to take one additional action before you fall. And here's where wall run kind of loses me. You cannot wall run into another wall run, because wall run specifically states you must start your movement on horizontal ground, meaning if you run halfway up the wall, you can't spend another action to run the rest of the way up, which is really unfortunate. You can jump off the wall, or if there's a ledge above you, you can grab it. You can even try to jump on something, but you can't keep wall running, which means this is incredibly limiting, and if the wall is taller than your move speed, you're out of luck. What is cool, though, is if you also took the water step feat from level 6, you can run up waterfalls, which is just cool but also most waterfalls probably aren't less than 50 feet tall, so... Wild Winds Initiate is fascinating. It is another key focus spell, but it's also a stance. By spending a focus point in an action, you enter the Wild Winds stance, which gives you 1d6 wind crash unarmed strikes. And these unarmed strikes have a range of 30 feet. They also have the agile, non-lethal, propulsive, and unarmed trait. Propulsive meaning you get to add half of your strength modifier to each thrown attack. First, let's start with the benefits. You can ignore concealment and all cover, which is phenomenal, and you get a permanent plus two circumstance bonus to AC against ranged attacks so long as you're in this stance. Now, the big limiting factor is that they have a range of 30 feet. Not a range increment of 30 feet. If something is 35 feet away from you, you don't just take a penalty to hit them. You cannot attack them. The range is 30 feet and it fizzles out at 30 feet, which is really unfortunate, so you can't attack anything farther than that. That's really the biggest con. Other than that, the damage is a little bit low, but the propulsive can be nice. It has its place and it has some cool support later on. I really like Wild Wind Stance. Another key focus spell stance is Clinging Shadows Initiate. 
While in the Clinging Shadow stance, you get access to the very weak Shadow Grasp Strikes. These are only 1d4 damage, but they are negative damage, which does have its place when attacking enemy weaknesses. But what's really interesting are the traits. Of course, it has Agile and Unarmed, but it also has Grapple and Reach, meaning the item bonus from your Hand Wraps of Mighty Blows do apply to your Grapple Checks. And because it has Reach, you get an extra 5 foot range on your grappling, which means you can grab targets from 10 feet away as a medium creature. That's amazing. On top of that, you get a plus 2 circumstance bonus to grappling. So if you have a plus 2 hand wraps of mighty blows, and you're in clinging shadow stance, you're getting a plus 4 total bonus to your grapple checks. That's incredible! And the bonus applies to the DC to escape from you! This is the single best grapple stance in the game. I have some mixed feelings about Pinning Fire. It's a free action, which means it's just a direct upgrade to the Monastic Archer's Flurry of Blows. Should you successfully strike a target with both attacks of your Flurry of Blows, you can pin their clothing to a wall or ground below them. This causes the creature to be immobilized, which sounds amazing on paper, but they can simply remove the arrows with a DC 10 athletics check. And here's where it gets kind of... It's good and it's bad. DC 10 is not even a DC. That is an automatic success for anything of level 8 or higher unless they nat 1. But at the same time, it does take an action to remove that. So action economy is good in that you just use Flurry of Blows and it kind of stuns the target. And I should admit, this does stack with Stunning Fist. If you have Stunning Fist and you Flurry of Blows with your Monastic Archer, then they will become Stunned 1 if they fail their save, and Immobilized, which means if they spend an action to remove the arrows, they're left with one action, which is really good in its own right. I think the reason Pinning Fire is as weak as it is is specifically because of the synergy with Stunning Fist. Without Stunning Fist, this is a sometimes cost the enemy one action. When combined with Stunning Fist, this feat is really good. Knockback Strike is interesting. For two actions, you strike a target and then make an athletics check to shove them at the same bonus as the unarmed strike. On top of that, this shove action does not count towards your multiple attack penalty. Meaning if this is the first action on your turn, you strike, you shove, and you still only have one multiple attack penalty. Pretty decent penalty economy, which is not something I talk about super often. Sleeper Hold is fun, but not super useful outside of some roleplay situations. For one action, if you have a target grabbed or restrained, you make an athletics check. If you succeed, they're clumsy one. If you critically succeed, they are unconscious for one minute. It also doesn't fall or drop anything, which is fascinating to me. Uh, but the reason this is so not that useful in combat is due to that little incapacitation trait, meaning if the target is a higher level than you, you cannot knock them unconscious, and the best you'll get is Clumsy 1 if you critically succeed against them. Now, in something like roleplay, if you have one weak little bandit left alive, you can absolutely just knock them out and take them back with you to your camp and interrogate them or whatever it is you sickos do. So this is really good in roleplay, really good at the end of an encounter if there's like some, some weak little guys left and you want to keep them alive, but overall, it's not the strongest feat. Wind Jump is another key focus spell. I'm get a lot of these. Wind Jump is really powerful. For a single action, you get a fly speed equal to your ground speed for one full minute. The only caveat is that you must end your turn on solid ground or fall. Meaning that if you stride three times straight up 150 feet, you're gonna have a hard landing. But if you are character level 11 or higher, you can make a DC 30 acrobatics check to stay in the air. How? No idea. You just do. Winding Flow is my single favorite monk feat in the entire game because it's just so broken. Once per round for a single action, you can take two move actions. Now they can't be the same action, but you can stand, step, or stride for one action, which means you can step stride to get away from attack of opportunity, or you can stride and then step into someone's range, or if you're knocked prone, you can stand up and step back, or there's so many combinations of things you can do that winding flow effectively makes the monk permanently hasted at level 10, and it's so busted and I love it. 
In the APG, we see Cobra and Venom, which is the permanent upgrade to, surprise, surprise, Cobra Stance. I bit my lip. Once per minute, while in Cobra Fang Stance, you can make a 5-foot reach Cobra Strike, which deals 1d4 persistent poison per weapon damage die. That's not bad. At level 10, that's probably 2, maybe even 3d4 persistent poison damage, which is not to be neglected, especially if the target has a weakness to poison. That is gonna chunk. And the big bonus is that right when you take this feat, you get a permanent plus one to your fortitude save and DC while in Cobra Stance. It becomes plus two instead of plus one. Peafowl Strut is pretty good. It doesn't feel like a huge level 10 upgrade. For one action, you can step twice and strike. That's great action economy, but it's a flourish. Honestly, I don't think this feat would be overpowered if you removed the Flourish trait. It would add a really cool dance to the Peafowl Monk. Step, step, strike, step, step, strike, step, step, strike. Sure, that is nine actions in one turn, which is insane, but six of them are step actions. So that's not super overpowered, but maybe it is. I could be wrong. That would be 30 feet of, of stepped movement per round, which could be busted. I don't know, Peafowl Strut feels cool, just a little bit limiting. Prevailing Position is a really cool reaction. If you are currently in a monk stance and you are targeted by an attack or attempting a reflex save, you can spend your reaction to exit your stance and gain a plus four to armor class or a plus four to your reflex save depending on which one, obviously, you're being targeted by. This is really cool. I love the idea of sacrificing your stance for a quick bonus to your uh, avoidance. It's a really cool image. It's a really cool feature. And I love that playing of getting in and out of stances mid-combat. A lot of people, and you can't blame them, a lot of people pick one stance and stay in that stance forever, but this kind of rewards you for having multiple stance options and being able to flip-flop between them. Very fun. Now careful, because Diamond Soul is an incredibly complicated feat. You get a plus one status bonus to saving throws against magic. Disrupt Key is really cool and kind of an awful idea. You make an unarmed strike against a living creature and block their life force. They take 2d6 persistent negative damage and they're enfeebled one until the persistent damage ends. That is nasty. And if you're doing this to something that has a weakness to negative damage, they're gonna die. If you're level 18, it deals 3d6 persistent negative. This is a really fun feat. Improved knockback is less impressive by comparison. When you shove or critically shove a target, you can follow them 5 or 10 feet, respectively. And if you shove them into a wall, you can deal damage equal to 6 plus your strength mod, which isn't bad. At level 12, that's probably 11 free damage on a shove. And if you're legendary in acrobatics, that goes up to 8 plus strength mod. Is it amazing for a level 12 feet? No. It's not bad either. Meditative focus! You can recover two focus points! Stance Savant is cool. When you roll initiative, you can assume a stance. Very nice. Saves you an action. This is a pretty standard one free action at the beginning of combat. Can't complain. Dodging roll is a really fascinating reaction. Should you be taking damage from a reflex save based spell like Fireball, you get to take a step action for free and gain resistance equal to your level. So if you're level 12, you're gaining 12 resistance to that fireball. Additionally, if this step takes you out of the range of effect, you do still take the damage, but you also get to add your dex mod to your resistance. So this might give you resistance 17 against that fireball, which is nuts. And this doesn't replace your reflex save. If you get a successful reflex save, you cut the damage in half, and you get the resistance from dodging roll. This is amazing. Focused shot is just good for the Monastic Archer. It's a special attack that ignores cover and concealment. It doesn't have the flourish trait, there's nothing to it aside from the concentrate trait. This is just something you can do over and over and over again. If a target is behind cover, you can just <laughs> focused shot, <laughs> focused shot, <laughs> focused shot. It's really good. Overwhelming Breath is pretty much designed for Key Strike. This is actually Monk Meta Magic, and if your next action is to cast a Monk Key spell with no duration and that deals damage, 
the target loses resistance to physical damage equal to your level. So if you use Overwhelming Breath followed by a key strike flurry of blows, and the enemy happens to have physical resistance like a golem, if you're level 12, they lose 12 physical resistance against both of your flurry of blows strikes. This is fantastic. Iron Blood Surge, we are upgrading the Iron Blood stance. For one action, you gain the plus one armor class as if you had used the parry trait, but your damage resistance increases to your strength modifier if it's higher for the same duration. I have some inherent issues with this feat in that it becomes useless, the higher level you get. Once you're level 18 or 20 and Iron Blood Stance is already resisting for five, if you're level 20, you might have a plus six to strength unless you have some crazy magic items bumping it higher. That means that in the end, Iron Blood Surge is only giving you one extra resistance at level 20, meaning it's a pretty useless feat. Don't get me wrong, at level 14, it's good. This will probably increase your resistance by three in those mid-level campaigns. But by level, I'm not a big fan of feats that get worse as you level up and make you regret picking them. Of course, you can always retrain out of it. I, it's just an, an inherent design issue I have. Mountain Quake, another upgrade for Mountain Stance. This is a single action you can use to stomp the ground, dealing your strength modifier of damage to all enemies within a 20-foot emanation with a basic fortitude save. Plus, if they fail the save, they're all knocked prone. And you can only do this once every 1d4 rounds, but an AoE knockdown that deals probably 5 damage? That's so cool! Also, when you take this, your dex cap increases from plus 1 to plus 2, meaning your AC is getting higher and higher. God, I love Mountain Stance! Tangled Forest Rake just makes Tangled Forest Stance even better at crowd control. You make a melee attack, and if you hit, you can move the target five feet. Just an even better way of being like, oh, no, 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 you move five feet this way. You stay, stay close, stay close. Timeless Body. This is a piece of flavor text that I believe is very important. You cease aging. A monk that takes this feat will never die of old age. Also, you get a plus two status bonus to saving throws against poisons and diseases and poison resistance equal to half your level. Overall, a really good defensive feat option with some really cool flavor for your character. Tongue of Sun and Moon is not a feat I would ever imagine for a monk, but I also think it's a really cool option. For a level 14 feat, you speak and understand all spoken languages. That's really important wording too. Spoken languages. You as a monk cannot read foreign languages, but you understand what someone is saying at all times. It's not a focus spell, it's nothing you have to re-up on yourself, it is a permanent knowledge and understanding of all spoken language. Super cool. Wild Winds Gust at level 14 is a huge upgrade for the Wild Winds stance. You can make your Wild Winds unarmed strike in a 30-foot cone or a 60-foot line, you roll once and attack every single creature of your choice within that area. This means you can ignore your allies with this one, and if there are five enemies in a 60-foot line, you get to attack all of them for two actions. Granted, every attack you make does increase for your multiple attack penalty. But the penalty doesn't go up until after all five strikes have been made. Form lock in the APG. This is a chokehold that undoes shapeshifting. You use your athletics to counteract a polymorph effect on your target. This means A, if there's something pretending to be something it's not, you can choke them back to their original form. But on top of that, if something has cast Polymorph on your friendly barbarian and turned them into a squirrel, you can walk over, pick the squirrel up, and choke your barbarian back into his normal form. This is stupid and I love it. Shadow's Web is a key focus spell that can only be used while in the Clinging Shadow's stance. This is a negative energy explosion. All creatures within a 30-foot burst. I think that's supposed to say emanation. That might be needing an errata, but I'm pretty sure it says surges from you, so I think that should be a 30-foot emanation. Regardless, they all make a basic fortitude save against 14d4 negative damage, and if they crit fail, they take double damage, 
They're stunned one and enfeebled two for one round and immobilized for one round. This does so much. Even on a normal fail, they're enfeebled two. Even on a success, they're enfeebled one. This is such a fun spell. And remember, this is a grapple stance. So you grab someone, you hold them tight, and then you shadows web explosion. Oh, and then they're enfeebled so they can't escape because they're... Ah, oh, it's so good! Also, whenever the focus spell gets heightened, it deals 2d4 additional damage. Not huge, but it's so good on its own. And if you took the monastic weaponry feat at first level, you can take Whirling Blade Stance. This is the coolest over-the-top stance in the game. Any melee weapon now has the Throne trait with a range of 10 feet. On top of that, when you throw the weapon, you manipulate it with your key, allowing you to throw it again using the first target as the base point. This means you can move it another 10 feet to strike a different target, or just dance it in place to strike the same target a second time, or more times if you have the actions. And at the end of your turn, it always flies directly back into your hand, almost like a free returning trait. This is so stupid cool, and I love it. And it may be called Whirling Blade Stance, but this works for any monk weapon. If you have a monk staff, you can throw it, and it'll just start bonking people left and right and fly back to your hand. This is so cool! Enlightened Presence makes sense, but it also seems unnecessary from a game design standpoint. You and all allies within 15 feet gain a plus two status bonus to will saves against mental effects. The reason I think it's so unnecessary is that tons of characters like bards and fighters already, and champions too, already have lower level versions of this. Granted, they're usually only a plus one, but level 16 to only increase that to plus two seems a bit weak. Granted, it is permanent. Master of Many Styles is a direct upgrade to Stance Savant. You can now switch stances as a free action at the start of every single turn. Very cool, and once again plays into that Stance Master who just keeps switching stances every turn. I love that idea. It's such a fun concept. Quivering Palm, another key focus spell. Quivering Palm is Touch of Death. For two actions, you make a melee unarmed strike, and if you hit and the target still lives, any time during the next month, you can activate Quivering Palm to murder them. They attempt a fortitude save, and if they critically succeed, nothing happens, the spell is over, and they're immune for 24 hours. If they succeed, they are stunned one, take 40 damage, and the spell ends. If they fail, they are stunned three, which means they basically skip their next turn in combat, they take 80 damage and then you can activate it again in 24 hours. If they critically fail their fortitude save, they die. You can only have Quivering Palm on one target at a time, and when this is heightened, it deals more damage. Keep in mind, this does have the incapacitation trait, which means at level 16, you're not gonna be able to use this on anything higher level than you, but as you level up, your options expand, and this is a great way to blackmail someone. Is that still blackmail? I think that's just a threat. Is murder threatening blackmail? Shattering Strike. For two actions, you make a melee unarmed strike and it ignores resistance. All resistance. And if you're attacking an object or something that has hardness, the hardness is halved. Flinging blow is honestly kind of lame. For two actions, you make an attack, and if it hits, the target makes a fortitude save against your class DC. If they fail, they are pushed 10 feet away. If they crit fail, they are pushed 20 feet, and if they hit an object or something that stops their movement, they take 1d6 damage per five feet of movement that was left over. For a level 16 feet, this is just a hit and an auto shove confirm. Comparing this to a level six auto trip confirm, flinging blow is very weak. Medusa's Gaze, another key focus spell. This is a two action focus spell that has you make an unarmed strike that can petrify people. If you hit, the target is slowed one. If you critically hit, the target is slowed two. Regardless, they must make a fortitude saving throw. 
If they fail this saving throw, the slowed condition increases by 1. If they crit fail, it increases by 2. They must make this save at the end of every single one of their turns. And if at any point the creature is unable to take an action because they are so slowed at the start of their turn, they are petrified permanently. One millimeter punch is a direct upgrade to one inch punch, but again, I don't know why this is a level 16 feet. Now, when you use one inch punch, you get to add a fortitude save onto it that if they succeed, fail, or crit fail, they are going to be pushed back five feet, 10 feet, or 10 feet per action. I don't know why Paizo has this obsession with giving level 16 monks a bunch of auto-confirm knockback stuff, but it's not that interesting. I guess it's good for knocking people off cliffs you're into that kind of thing. Diamond Fists is pretty cool. Your unarmed strikes now all have the forceful trait, and if they already had the forceful trait, it bumps their damage die up one step. Kinda cool, kinda eh. Again, level 18? <laughs> Empty Body, one more key focus spell. For one minute, you are ethereal as though you would cast ethereal jaunt and it doesn't take concentration. You're just a ghost now, have fun. Meditative Wellspring, you now get all three focus points back whenever you refocus. Swift River, if you ever end your turn and you have a speed penalty, the immobilized, or slowed condition, you end it. Now you can only end one, but every single turn you can just say, nah, I'm not slowed, nah, nah, I'm not immobilized, nah, I'm fine, this is fantastic, and honestly, kind of the only level 18 feet worth taking in the CRB, not gonna lie. Level 18's key center in the APG is okay. Once per minute, you can enter into any key focus spell stance such as wild winds or clinging shadows without spending a focus point. This isn't bad, definitely better for clinging shadows since it has that fancy uh, explosion, this lets you do that one more time per combat, uh, but it's not super useful for wild winds. Key form, one more key focus spell. All right, buckle up because this does a lot. By spending one action, you enter your key form for one minute. Your entire body begins to glow, you can fly as fast as your land speed, and you choose force, lawful, negative, or positive. While in this form, all of your strikes deal 1d6 bonus damage of the chosen damage type. You also give off a 5 foot emanation of light, which means that all creatures, including allies, who start their turn within that light, take 2d6 damage of your chosen damage type. This light does counteract darkness effects, and by spending an action, you can expand it from a 5-foot light to a 30-foot emanation of light, which, remember, does burn your comrades. You lose the non-lethal trait on all of your attacks in this form. You take a minus 2 penalty against emotion effects, but a plus 2 bonus to saving throws against all other mental effects. Overall, this is okay. It's kind of a cool passive. You can sort of think of it as deal 2d6 damage to adjacent enemies at the start of their turns. Really neat. Overall, it doesn't do all that much, but it's just some sort of bonus unavoidable damage. You know, that 2d6 doesn't get a saving throw, you don't have to make anything. It's just kind of cool and all of your attacks deal a bonus d6. You can't complain, really. Triangle Shot in comparison is not that incredible, but it's not bad either. For two actions, you get to shoot three shots at one target, all at your current multiple attack penalty, but also at a minus two each. Triangle Shot does trigger Stunning Fist as though it was Flurry of Blows, and if all three shots hit, the target suffers 3d6 persistent bleed damage. This has a lot going for it, and it can mess up a little bit. You know, if you miss even one, you're not going to get that bleed damage, uh, but it's just sort of an upgraded Flurry of Blows. It's three attacks instead of two, and they're all at the same penalty rather than the penalty increasing. If you're a Monastic Archer, you're probably taking this feat. And finally, level 20 feats. I've already been recording for over an hour. God, I can't believe we're almost done. Fighters and monks have so many feats! Enduring Quickness. The monk is permanently quickened, but can only use the extra action to stride or leap, or if they are going to do the two action high jump or long jump, they can use their quickened action as one of the two required. Really good. Just great at positioning, which is what monks do best. Fuse Stance is so cool. You take two stances, and you put them together. You give it a unique name, and you get all benefits and all penalties of those stances. Now, unfortunately, there are some incompatible stances, such as crane and mountain, as it says here. If both stances say you can only make a specific type of strike, 
you cannot fuse those stances because Crane says you can only make Crane Wing, Mountain says you can only make Falling Boulder. If you combine them, you're not allowed to attack. <laughs> but you can combine, say, Crane Stance and Dragon Stance. Granted, you'll have to make Crane Wing attacks, but you'll get the bonuses of Dragon Stance. There's some cool things you can do here. You can mix, like, Clinging Shadows and Monkey Gorilla, but whatever. There's some really cool stuff. You can get super creative. I love creative feats like this that say, hey, take our design and do whatever you want with it. Very nice. And finally, the last level 20 monk feat. What is it? Do you get a chance to auto kill on all attacks? Maybe an increased crit chance? Increased crit damage? Kind of. Your unarmed strikes get deadly d10. If you critically hit, you get to add 3d10 to your damage. Happy level 20! Yeah.